you don't know. Good morning, everyone. We've got several missing this morning that we'll mention again during our second song. Uh, but we'll be turning to hymn number nine and ten. We're going to sing the first two verses of hymn number nine. Then we're going to go down and sing Majesty through just one time. Then we're going to go back up and do the third verse. So it's two, Majesty, three.
499, singing the first, second, and standing on the last. support that, that you can give them. We'd ask that you be with us through the coming days ahead and continue to bless us and be with Mike as he brings us a message this morning. Christ, let me pray. Amen. Okay, we'll be singing Heaven Came Down, singing the first and last verses of Heaven in number 510.
uh, if the young people would want to go down, we'll let them go down, and then Mike will come up and give us our message. You're kind of... Run, little children, run. <laughs> You're not going to get another one. Surprise, everybody. Hi. Hi. Uh, I've seen you all a million times. I know most of your names somewhat, but I'm going to be fuzzy on all that. I just happen to be in the right place at the right time, or maybe wrong place, wrong time. Depends on your perspective here. I came up to visit Mom again this weekend because I had just an opportunity. And by the way, I'm a campus minister. I'm a campus minister. We don't have services on, on weekends, on Sundays, which is why this preacher often is up here on Sundays. I live eight hours away. I'm in eastern Tennessee, past Gatlinburg. It's actually a beautiful spot. It is beautiful. We grew up in Oblong, as you all know. Uh, but I love being in Tennessee. been there most of my life now. Uh, before you too far, thanks for being the family for my family. Uh, when things happened down at camp and you all said, hey, Mark, we'd love to have you here, that was a big deal to him. He loves being here. He loves you all. Uh, he and Penny and all her kids. Mom, I think, does too, but she's going to follow around wherever she's going. But <laughs> thanks for being their family. That's That's been an important part of my life is to have my brother happy about things. I don't want him unhappy. Uh, any preacher that can't preach at this time of the year is not worth his salt and needs to go find another job. And so... You can call me at 9 p.m. and say, hey, can you pinch hit in late November, early December? The answer always should be yes, because there's plenty of things we can preach about that have to do with who we are and what we believe and where we're headed, by the way. And where we're headed is an important part and an important aspect of this. You and I have taken promises to the bank in the past, promises that other people have made, maybe our parents, maybe our siblings, maybe a significant other, <clears throat> Maybe the government, I don't know. <laughs> we've taken these promises and we've sort of filtered them through. Can I believe this eventually? How is this going to affect me eventually? But when that promise comes from God and it comes through another person, that becomes a little bit more difficult for us, frankly. I walk out this door and somebody says to me, God told me my belief factor is going way down all of a sudden. You can say like something your mom, my mom told me this, or the state senator told me this, but if you, if you say something like, God told me, ah, I'm going to shake my head and I'm going to smile. I'm going to try to make you feel good about yourself, but you're not going to convince me quickly that you have a word from the Lord that I need to hear. It's just that way, and I don't think I'm alone. I think that probably most of us would do the same thing, even if the preacher got up and said, God told me. There's a whole lot of this going on. And I think it's appropriate. I think it's appropriate. I like being a skeptic. I like being intelligent, I think. I like being able to sort through things and, and, and to realize, is this true or not? We have in our Bibles then a lot of stories where people say things like, God told me. God told me this was going to happen. Thankfully, I've got the, the benefit of hindsight that I can look at those stories and say, yeah, I can believe those stories. They're part of, part of the big story that I believe in. But if I'd been living in those days, I would have been the biggest hypocrite, the biggest Pharisee. I, I would have been one of those guys on the sidelines saying, show me. Show me. Show me that God spoke to you. Show me that God's got something to say. Show me that his promise that you claim he says is something that I need to listen to. Deep back in the Bibles, the Lord says something to Adam. He says something to Eve, and he says something to a serpent. This is Genesis chapter 3. In reverse order, he speaks to the serpent first. And in his speech to the serpent, he gives a, what we might call a curse. Uh, that's not the word that's used there in Genesis 3, but the Lord says to the serpent, you're going to crawl on your belly all the days of your life. And... Although your seed will bite the woman's seed's heel, her seed will crush your head. 
This is one of those promises early on that must have been significant enough that it was reserved for us. It wasn't like it was idle talk. When God said something about what was going to happen, Adam and Eve took this to the bank. And they believed that something was going to happen through their seed. In Galatians, by the way, Paul looks at that seed and realizes that that's a singular word. Not a plural word. It wasn't for the, the seeds to come. In English, we have seeds as a plural word. But he said that it's to the seed, and Paul says that points to one person. We're not quite sure what Adam and Eve really understood about this promise that God had made to the serpent about his head. But they believed enough to pass that story on to their kids and their kids' kids and their kids' kids' kids, kids all the way down through until it was written for us. One day, God took Abraham out to a field. When I imagine fields and stars, that's what I imagine right there. Shorn corn and the ability to see every light in the world. In Tennessee, we don't get that as easily as we do up in Illinois. I walked out the other night, and I thought, oh, man, there really are stars out of here. This is so beautiful. I don't live in a huge city, but it's just where I am, trees and stuff. When I think of looking at it and all the stars in the world, I think about being in a harvested field in November and looking out and seeing everything. And God took Abraham out and said, count them if you can. Count them. Go ahead. He said, I'm going to bless you in such a way that you will bless all the nations by the number of kids that are going to come. Abraham knew it had to start with, with one, right? He knew at least there had to be one to get this thing started. And so for years and years and years, he keeps convincing Sarah, God's got a promise for us, right? We need to go back to the bedroom and make God's promise happen here. Years and years and years, Abraham's working on this Nothing happens until it comes. The people of God then, all through the Old Testament, from Samuel to Isaiah and Jeremiah through Malachi, all kept looking at these promises that God had given with an expectation that it was going to be fulfilled. God has given promises, and not just those two, but to various others. To David, right? There were several there that were given to David. And, and others, and they, and they preserved them for us. God had made promises, and God was going to make good on these promises. But times, when times are hard, and someone's made a promise to us, and it doesn't happen immediately, we get caught in the time problem, right? You and I, we simply have this perspective of time that's, that's linear. Time moves for me like this. It moves for you like this, too. Point A to point B, and then point C comes later. This is the way it works. I can't conceive of time that moves in a circular motion. Some physicists say that that's true. I don't believe it. For you and me, we start at birth, we get a little bit older, and then there's a death date. It just works that way for us. And so when someone says something's going to happen, we want it to happen before it gets too long. We know that our time has a, a due date on it, has an extension to it. And so when these promises are made to God... <laughs> Let me out. I want to hear the preacher instead. <laughs> That's what they're saying. Whoever that guy is. When God makes his promises, these people who are following him, they want to see it happen. And as you know, if a promise, is, if a promise goes unfulfilled for a long time, we become jaded. If my wife says to me, I'm going to cook your favorite meal someday soon, and that someday soon is... 23 years? I got a problem, right? Oh, I'll do it one day. I'll do it one day. We expect these promises to, to happen. We expect people, or God in this case, to make good on his word. And when it doesn't happen, we can become a little bit jaded. The curious thing about the Jewish people is that although that there was this amount of time, significant amount of time, and although God had made a lot of promises, they didn't give up. And I think that that's the most curious thing in the world. I'm, I'm quick to move on. I am. I'm quick to move on to the next thing. But this group of people did not. In John chapter 1, there's this really odd story that's beautiful. At the end of John chapter 1, a man named Philip comes to his buddy named Nathaniel. And Philip says, hey, we have found the Messiah. Nathaniel probably had heard talk like this before. 
right? And maybe it was, hey, come see the circus. Maybe it was really, hey, here's somebody who looks like what a Messiah might be. But Philip's, uh, Nathaniel's heard this before, and he's, he's sort of tucking his arms going, I'm not sure. The interesting part is that when Philip found Nathaniel, you remember this part of the story in John 1? Philip finds Nathaniel, and he is under a fig tree. Why might a grown man be under a fig tree? I, I've heard a couple of, of explanations, but there's only one that makes sense to me. A grown man might be under a fig tree <clears throat> if he was praying. We remember fig trees, right? Big leaves, a lot of shade, good shade. You can crawl under there. You can pray for a significant amount of time, especially if you're a Jewish person. And you can pray without being interrupted, maybe even being seen. Philip finds Nathaniel and says, we have found the Messiah. Most likely, Philip waited for Nathaniel to be done with his prayer. And every Jewish man would have ended his prayer by saying, and Lord, please send the Messiah. Philip nudges him and says, hey, we found the Messiah. And Nathaniel's like, I don't know. I'm not quite sure I can believe my prayer has been answered that quickly. I prayed this prayer before, right? Uh, show me. You remember Philip's words, right? Come and see. Come and see. I'm not going to tell you. Come and see. And as Philip and Nathaniel come to Jesus, Jesus says something like, Here is an Israelite in whom there is no guile, there's no deceit. Here's an honest man. Nathaniel immediately becomes defensive. And I would have too. How do you know me? You don't know me. You don't know me from Adam. <laughs> from Adam. You don't know me from Adam. How can you say things like that? And Jesus says what? While you were still praying under the fig tree, I saw you. Immediately, immediately, the next word out of Philip's mouth is, my Lord and my God. He's not making some kind of crude explanation. He's identifying Jesus as Lord and God. He's identifying him as the answer to the prayer. He went from jaded and show me to I'm following you for the rest of my life, which he did. Because he understood that this was the answer to the prayer he'd been looking for. It's, it's sort of beautiful. It really is. It's, it's quick and easy for us to pass this story by. But I want to talk about another guy that we have who was part of this promise. And, and we're going to read his story this morning. This is, I'm really doing Mark a huge favor, by the way. I'm setting him up in a huge way. For all the rest of these Christmas stories, this is the one that we need to get to, but the preachers tend to push to the back quickly because it just doesn't have the, the appeal of Mary and Joseph and shepherds and wise men. This is that one that comes before that. This is Luke chapter 1, and this is verse 5. I'm going to read quite a bit this morning. Uh, I expect we'll be done by 3.30. I don't know. <laughs> Just kidding. The first four verses of Luke chapter 1, by the way, are incredible. I'm not going to read them. You can read them later on. They're important for us as Christians to identify that this is, this is real and not some kind of fairy tale. So read those first four verses later on. Verse 5. There was, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the division of Abiah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking all the commandments and ordinances, and ordinances of the Lord blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. Already the story opens, and... This sounds somewhat familiar, right? If we've read Genesis, if Mark's been preaching through Genesis, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel, right? We've heard this that kind of thing before. We sort of expect it to happen. Except that, like Abraham and Sarah, here they're old. And I'm just going to paint this part of the picture, too. Maybe they've given up on this. That, that's old folly for them, right? And those of us who have some age and whiten our whiskers, we remember how, well, times change after a while. Expectations, sometimes you just leave them buried, right? You don't want to dredge up the past. You don't want to make her angry unnecessarily. So it was that while he was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, 
His lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Not everybody got to go to the temple. Not every priest got to go to the temple. This was a big deal. This man, Zechariah, gets to go into the temple in order to burn incense. It's an honor for him. He probably would have prepared very well. Quite certain he would have asked Elizabeth to have washed everything he was going to wear that day. It was probably very much the law that he had to do that. But he had scrubbed up in preparation for his opportunity to enter into the temple. He didn't go to the most holy place where the ark had been, but he went into the temple, into the vestment area, uh, to burn this incense. The whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of the incense. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Now, I, I don't know this whole business about angels. Again, I'm a skeptic, right? There might be an angel walk through that back door right now. Greg would tackle him because you're supposed to come through that door. <laughs> but if an angel walk through the back door right now, I, I might not believe it. He might be big and tall and shiny and wings. I don't, I don't know, but I, I probably wouldn't be. Uh, you put me on. I, I would think that maybe my morning breakfast was not good. I, I don't know. I don't know how I would be convinced that there was an angel appearing to me. But Zachariah believes it. I'm quite sure what it was about his presence. Always we remember, right, when angels appear, their first words are, fear not. There's got to be something about them that causes fear. But an angel appears to Zechariah in the temple. Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. And the angel said, of course, do not be afraid. And then he goes on. Zechariah, your prayer is heard. Now, Zechariah, at this point, might have been a little stumped. Like, what prayer? I've been praying all of my, and I'm going to make up this number, 80 years. Maybe he's not 80, but maybe he's close. I've been praying my entire 80 years. I gotta, I've offered you all kinds of prayers. What prayer? What are you talking about? Now your prayer is, your heard, is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall neither drink wine nor strong drink. He will also be with, filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go out with power before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient of the wisdom or the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. How about that? That's quite an introduction to your kid, right? The day your wife, you came home from work, your wife said, hey, we're having a baby. Is this what she told you? This is what this kid's going to be like. He's going to be powerful and strong. He's going to turn the hearts of kids back to the Lord. By the way, this is a reference to, to Malachi. Uh, we remember this, I hope. I think it's Malachi 4. If not, it's Malachi 3, that final prophet there in the Old Testament, where Malachi says, one is coming who will prepare the way, who will turn the hearts of the children back to the this is Zechariah. Zechariah knew this implicitly as a good Jewish man. He knew what the angel was saying was part of this prophecy of Malachi. And I can't imagine he could have been less fearful. <laughs> I think I would have wet my pants or my tunic or whatever he's wearing. I would have wet something in a huge way, not just at the appearance of the angel, but at being told that my child was going to be a part of this. <clears throat> of course, Zechariah, like me, says... How shall I know this? I'm an old man. My wife also is well advanced in years. Mr. Pragmatism here, right? Ah, if there's one word that I hope somebody uses in my funeral, it's pragmatic. I would love for somebody to say, man, that guy, you know what? He didn't just believe in pipe dreams. He was all about where the rubber hits the road. He believed in reality. How could this be? By the way, before we move on, Mary is going to say something similar, right? When Gabriel comes to Mary, she says, Gabriel says, you're going to be with child. You're going to give birth. And Mary says, what? How can this be? These people know biology. It, this, is not, this is not unscientific. They all get what's going on. Mary, for Mary, she's saying, 
I've not been with a man. That's what she says to the angel. To Zechariah, he says, uh, I'm real old and so is my wife. This kind of thing doesn't happen. How can this be? And I just want to point out here, and maybe you want to take this off the record, that I think that Gabriel's a bit of a sexist. <clears throat> just putting that out there in a different kind of way than you believe, because what he does to Mary said, oh, Mary, it's okay. It's no big deal. But what he does to Zechariah say, boom, you can't talk. That's what he says. Two different reactions to the same question about a child being born. He treats the, he treats the older man with a lot more power and energy than he does to the, to the young, wonderful little girl. I, I really don't find that too awful. I would have treated my daughter very differently than I would my father as well uh, if I was in such a position. But I just want to point out that both of them asked this question. Again, a pragmatic question. And the angel treats them very differently. The angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel. It's one of those things, right? Like, I'm Batman. What are, you, what are you all questioning me? I sit at the right hand of God. I will sit to speak to you and to bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you'll be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you do not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Okay. I... I Again, it's sort of funny, I think, to look back at this. This old man is talking back to the angel, and the angel says, well, talking back, there you go. Bang. You won't be able to talk. You're going to have to convince all kinds of people, all kinds of wonderful things, without the use of your tongue. So, <laughs> good times are headed for you. <laughs> the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he couldn't speak to them. <clears throat> they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. He beckoned to them and remained speechless, and so it was. As soon as the days of the service were completed, that he departed to his own house. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the women. Now, before we get to finishing up, just a couple of things here. Again, Zachariah's got to go back to his wife, and this is natural childbirth. He's got to convince her that they need to get going to do the Lord's work. And she doesn't know anything about the angel. And he can't explain it to her with his mouth. He's got to convince her somehow what they need to go and do. And she is excited and all this also just a little bit fearful. And so for the first five months of her pregnancy, she remains hidden. I, again, I don't know that I understand all that. It would seem to me that maybe the last five months of her pregnancy, she remains. But here she remains hidden for those first five months. We know what happens in the sixth month, right? Which is the next verse in verse 26. The sixth month of the pregnancy, Mary comes. Mary's going to come with news of her own about her own pregnancy, which is different. Mary's going to come and talk to her but for five months as she's still <clears throat> fit and trim, right? Before she's showing anything, she's going to remain in solitude until her cousin Mary comes along. Let me point out here a couple things before we get too far. Zechariah understood that the child being born to him and Elizabeth was not the Messiah. He understood that. He understood that the child being born to him and Elizabeth was part of the prophecy of Malachi, about the one who would prepare the way but he got that his kid wasn't the Messiah, and yet was part of this big story, part of this big great promise, part of what all of his people, from Adam to Abraham to David to Samuel to everybody else, had been a part of. He realized that he was getting to play a role in this, and he was excited about it. Later on, uh, in Luke chapter 2, there's going to be another old man that comes. He used to hold the baby Jesus, remember Simeon? Sort of a fun thing. We're told that he has lived in the temple. He is waiting for uh, the Messiah to come. He knows that the Messiah is going to come in his life. Somehow God has revealed that to him, and he's waiting for it to happen. And finally, when he gets to, I, I sort of imagine him snatching the baby from Mary, right? She comes in to bring Jesus in for the purification. I see this old man walking up, sort of crazy eyed, right? He's probably got hair grown way out of his ears, probably stinks and smells. I imagine him coming up and swiping that baby from her. 
Can you imagine the gulp that she takes? Can you imagine Joseph probably getting ready to take a swig at this guy and realizing that if he does, he's going to completely obliterate his face. So he doesn't. And Simeon says things like, oh, here's the one. Here's the one. Now you can dismiss me, Lord. Now you can dismiss me because I have seen your son. I have seen the one that you've sent. We're going to end with this song. And I don't know why songs are important. This is not the kind of guy that I am. But sometimes in the Bible, when good things, important things happen to people, they sing. David does this. I, I, I don't do this. If you're a musician and you do this, kudos to you. I just don't understand that kind of thing. Twice in Luke chapter 1, we have songs. Zachariah sings a song and Mary sings a song. Simeon's going to sing a song later on. It's just part of the way that this thing works. And I don't, I like singing songs. I participate. I love hearing Mary play, by the way. I love singing these hymns. But when something good or bad happens to me, I don't go home and write lyrics. I just don't do that. And yet that's a part of this story here. Mary's song is good. The song that she sings when she realizes that she's about to give birth to the Messiah. The song that Zechariah sings is excellent. So we're going to finish this morning with Zechariah's song at the end of Luke chapter 1. Again, recall, Zechariah realizes who his son is and who he isn't. Uh, nine months after the conception of John by Zechariah and Elizabeth, the baby is born. We remember the story, I hope. Uh, they want to call the kid after his father. And poor mute old Zachariah is over the corner, trying to get up, trying to say, no, 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 you can't do that. Everybody's ignoring him and looking around. And finally this guy grabs a tablet. Oh, his name is John. John. Why John? Because the angel said his name is John. That's why. His name is John. And immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed and he spoke. Praising God. Verse 67, his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Listen to this. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel. He has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been seen since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve and fear him with might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. All this first part is corporate. Zechariah is not saying, God blessed me. He's saying God has blessed us. God has made this thing happen for us, for all of us. Remember all that history stuff? Zechariah realizes that the benefits are for the nations. Verse 76, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. You will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. My dad was a good man. You probably hear stories about dad on occasion. He was not always a good man. But by the time that I got to know him, he was a pretty good man. He didn't sing a blessing like this over me. Or over Mark. And certainly not over John. <laughs> this is one of those things that could, could have been done to a, have announced our birth in such a way. I mean, I've got this little book at home. It's pink because they thought I was going to be a girl. Man, I have this little book at home. Got a piece of my hair cut out there. Got this announcement. It was a boat. I don't know why there was a boat. It was a part of my wedding or my birth announcement. But there it was. And everybody who attended and all the gifts that they brought to me, being the firstborn, of course, because all eyes should be on the firstborn all the time. But words like this were not spoken of me. They weren't. I, I, I'm not part of that promise. As good of a kid as I turned out to be, I think. I still was not John the Baptist. I didn't prepare the way for the Lord. This was something a big deal. And Zechariah saw it and noticed it and publicly told everybody with his newly loosened tongue. I've never had surgery in my mouth or anything. 
I, I've been able to speak every day of my life, I think. I can't imagine what it would be like to go for many months without speaking. But when this guy gets a chance to speak, he does. And it's good. It's good. He thanks the Lord for his blessing to them and to the whole world. And let's recall, the blessing that God made to Abraham was to all nations. And then he says, son, you're the one. You're the one that's going to help the Messiah. You are the one that's been prophesied to Malachi. You're going to bring light to those in darkness. You're going to guide the feet of those to peace. Before we close, I'm going to read verse 77 again. You will give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. As Christians, this is something important that we believe in. We believe that we are saved. Not just saved from this world and from problems in this world. We are saved from the problems that we create through our own sinfulness. And it's not just that sin is somebody else's thing that somehow I'm in the way of. We believe that we have participated in this rebellion for the Creator. In some kind of way that's subversive. Maybe a little bit less than the other guy because he's really bad. But still, in some kind of way that we need to be forgiven. And interestingly, that's part of Zechariah's song. He talks about how salvation is the forgiveness of sin. Something that we hear about through Jesus and through Paul an awful lot later on. But sometimes we just forget. We're not just saved from the bad things in the world. We're saved from our own sinfulness, our own rebellion against the king. This is a beautiful time of the year, as you all know. Lights are twinkling. I put up lights in mom's house the other day. She has four little Christmas trees scattered around with various things going on. We all like to hear our kids sing Christmas carols or to go out to the park, I guess, to see those, those lights out there, too. And it's sort of that special time. I, I don't know how to get around it. As Americans, we've created this culture of the Christmas spirit, so much so that people can even get in the Christmas spirit without acknowledging Jesus. Sort of myopic, if you ask me, but people do this a lot. They will celebrate Christmas and not even mention the Christ. We don't do that. We're excited about who the Christ is, about what he's done for us. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation as typical. Mary, she's going to here and lead us in this because you don't want me to do this. I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing, Lord, I'm coming home, page 490. But as we stand, I'd like you to pray. Our Lord God in heaven, you're good and great. You are wonderful. You use people like us, ordinary, common people, and you bless the world. Lord, thank you for Zechariah and for his willingness to participate. Thank you for his believability in what you had said to the people who had gone before him. Thank you, Lord, that he was able to act in such a way to bring John, that John might prepare the way for Christ. Lord, we love you because you have and will forgive us. Lord, lead us in a life committed to you forever. We pray through Christ. Amen. <clears throat>
the first, second, and last verses of hymn number 596.
Thank you, Mary. Uh, if you notice in our bulletin board, or bulletin board, in our bulletins, uh, the Christmas program is during service on the 18th. Thank you, Julie, and those helping you uh, corral our wild bunches. So, um, anyway, be sure and have your kids here practicing for that. Also, in the very bottom part down there, there is no more Christmas st Operation. star. Operation Christmas star kind of changed things. It kind of changed. It so. kind of changed. Uh, we've been contacted to do green beans again. Uh, so there's a couple of ladies out of the the uh, junior high system that's taking care of it, and they're wanting to actually do for a hundred different families. So uh, we have a couple of weeks, three weeks, whatever. Uh, at the grocery store, throw in a couple more cans of green beans, bring them out here, and we'll be sure to get, get them there. So let's stand. Dear God, once again, we give you thanks for all the blessings which you've given to us. We realize that uh, you're looking over us always. We ask that you to uh, guide and direct us and uh, give us a chance to uh, to tell others about the wondrous love that you have in store. Uh, be with us always in your son's precious name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.